In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, the man, the only Father, God. Uh, thank you, Lord, for allowing us this time to just uh, leave the world and uh, try to empty our minds and block out everything and to just uh, focus on you and go deeper together in your word. Um, don't le let us, oh Lord, to leave this uh, Bible study empty-handed and, and give us something to take with us that we can apply apply in our everyday life. But I said, please hear us through the intercessions of Mary and all your saints of Mary. So please, you from the beginning, through the mighty power of your love-giving cross, please, O oh Lord, make us ready to pray thankfully. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us there our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. As always, feel free to jump in if you have any questions or anything or comments. Uh, last time we covered like the first half of uh, chapter 5 from verse 1 through 14. I'll mention some of the yani, highlights or things we concluded from that passage. Um, Haga, the first thing we said, before making any decisions, um, I'll summarize it this way. We tend to think about what will the people think? What will the people say? Stuff like that. And the, what we want to do is to focus on what will God think? What will he say? What will the angels uh, think and say? And the saints. Um, because when you think about it, really, you will never be able to please all people, no matter what you do, no matter what you decide. Any, uh, people's judgment yeah, of any situation is often biased, and it's affected by the lenses of their own lives and their own experiences. So just know <laughs> that you're never, ever going to be able to please all people and just focus on pleasing God instead. Actually, there's a verse in, I think, the Gospel of St. Luke, where our Lord Jesus Christ says, woe to you if everybody likes you, if everybody speaks highly of you. So remember, even our Lord Jesus Christ himself, there were people who loved him and liked him. There were people who couldn't stand him. So focus instead on what, what he likes, what he wants. Um, <clears throat> and then we said to beware of like uh, a negative thought that we are liable to fall into. Said that when a virtuous believer is going through a very hard time in their life and they're they're liable to get depressed or discouraged and to think, man, I have toiled and labored and suffered in vain. I fasted and I prayed and I obeyed and I forgave and I served and I gave and I did this and this and this. And like they're so discouraged and so frustrated, they feel like it was all wasted. But verse one in, in chapter five is written to such people. It said, hang in there. The day will come when you will arise and you will stand boldly because none of it was in vain. And and we remember it in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, where St. Paul is saying, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of God. Don't let anything discourage you or stop you from repenting, from praying, from serving, from giving, from worshiping, from getting up again to live according to God. A knowing that in the Lord, your labor is not in vain. In the Lord, if you focus on what he thinks, your labor is not in vain. So in any circumstances, don't ever let yourself fall into such a trap and then uh, we talked about salvation and the really the most simple and profound view of salvation in the orthodox concept as his holiness pope shenouda uh, said i was saved i am being saved and i will be saved i was saved when i was baptized my my salvation journey began at my baptism i am being saved throughout my life of repentance and transformation as the Lord chastens me and, uh, you know, improves me and makes me more Christ-like while I'm here on earth. And then I will eventually and finally be saved. The salvation will be concluded, um, will be complete on Judgment Day. Um, and then we said something that was kind of harsh to hear, but it's... Um, a good reminder for us to, to keep in mind. And we said that every time we choose sin over our Lord Jesus Christ, we crucify him again. Every time we premeditate and go against his will, I'm not talking about like the sin out of weakness or unintentional or unknowingly, etc. But when we pre premeditate and go against his will intentionally, we crucify him again. 
every time we take communion in an unworthy manner, uh, we crucify him again, as it says in um, 1 Corinthians 11. And we said that, like we saw a contrast between how much effort people spend on pursuing sin or a carnal worldly life versus uh, yeah, a spiritual life. We said, yeah, some sins fall in our lap while we're like finding our own business. You find the temptations just popping up. But sometimes we work very hard, we work very diligently, or we exhaust ourselves in pursuing sin or pursuing a carnal way of living and and we wear ourselves out with matters of the world, with wealth and and stuff like that. And yet, when it comes to yani, a fraction of the labor that, that is asked to spend for our salvation, for our spiritual life, yani, we whine and complain and we make excuses and, and we find reasons for why it's hard to do or why we don't do it. Um. And then we said that, Yanni, something that each one of us ought to do, we said if you take a step back and you take a quick survey of your life, what percentage of your life or your thoughts or your efforts or your energy or emotions or even your conversations with people are spent on arrogance or wealth or boasting or, or me, uh, you know, getting your way, getting like pursuing your own comforts and luxury versus the spiritual or the eternal. And we talked about um, uh, basically remembering how life is fleeting. And we, we said, look at like your name, your dad's name, your grandfather's name, your great grandfather's name, etc. We said that almost all of us probably know our names like maybe for three or four generations, five generations, something like that. Or, or when we talked about like Think about in the liturgy when you commemorate the uh, departure of somebody, how far do you go back? Probably not past your your grandparents. Uh, you might not even know the departure date of your great grandparents. So life is fleeting; it disappears quickly, as quickly as it appeared. And then the last thing we said, like um, we saw how it's the same premise, but the conclusion or the decision that followed was very different, because in 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 the beginning, in chapter two, I think, the, the wicked, the godless people said, life is fleeting. Life is a vapor, right? Um, so, Yolo, let's live up and party it up and not spare anything. Let's, like, use the roses and not spare the best perfumes and let, let's consume everything. Versus in here talking about, like, life is like a vapor. It is fleeting, like a shadow, like an arrow or a bird flying in the sky. So, therefore, let's not waste any time on fleeting things and focus on the deeds that will go before us on judgment day. And they will give a testimony on our behalf on judgment day, and they will determine our eternity. Um, I, I just came across today a quote by St. John Chrysostom who said, like, if, if you realize how quickly you will be forgotten by people after your death, you will be consumed only with um, pleasing God. Something like that. Um, all right. And that brought us to today's part. Uh, before we go on, does anybody have any questions or comments or anything? All righty. Uh, so let's go ahead and... Uh, Start reading. We're going to read the, the remaining verses in chapter 15. So that's going to be from verse 15 to the end, to 23. Uh, so just let me know who's going to read and which version. Yeah. From verse 15. I have it highlighted in blue. Uh, I can read public reader. Uh, okay. Thank you. Go ahead. You're welcome. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God to me. For the hope of the impious is like feathers, which are blown away by the wind, uh, and like a thin foam which is dispersed by a storm, and like smoke which is scattered by the wind, and like the memory of a guest who passed by one day. But the just will live forever, and their reward is with the Lord, and the thought of them is with the Most High. 
Therefore, they will receive a beautiful kingdom and a crown of splendor from the hand of the Lord, for for with his right hand he will cover them, and with his holy arm he will defend them. And his zeal will take up arms, and he will equip his servants for retribution on their enemies. He will put on justice as a breastplate, and he will grasp sure judgment as a helmet. He will select fairness as an invincible shield. Yet he will sharpen his severe wrath into a spear, and he will fight with those of the world against the irrational. Shafts of lightning will hurl forth accurately, and as if as if from a well-curved bow of clouds, they will be expelled and will fly to the determined mark. And hail will be cast like stones full of anger, and the water of the sea will rise up against them, and the rivers will charge forth partially. Keep going. The spirit of virtue will stand firm against them, and like a whirlwind will divide them, and he will lead all the world of iniquity into a wasteland, and malice will overthrow the seats of power. Glory to be to the Holy Trinity, our God, forever and to the age of all ages. I mean, thank you. So yeah. as as you can see here in Coptic Creed, it went to 24, because remember earlier there was a verse that was in Coptic Creed, it was split into two verses, but in RSV and um the Jerusalem Bible was it was in one verse, but anyway, it's the same text, yeah. So look at the contrast with how it will be for the virtuous. Like in verse fifteen, it says, "But the virtuous live forever. The recompense lies with the Lord. The Most High takes care of them." So look at remember what we were reading earlier from from last week. So there's. Just in this one verse, there's three differences. Uh, fleeting versus forever. Uh, the second thing is whatever they labored or toiled for was like a shadow or a bird or an arrow. Versus the, the virtuous, whatever they labored for and toiled for is recorded and saved and recompensed and, and rewarded. All of it. It remains. It's not at all fleeting. And then lastly, um, yeah, I mean, for the godless, it's like a horrifying realization that I was wrong and blind and it's too late for me to do anything about it. Versus here, for the virtuous, it's going to be the bliss and the joy and peace of knowing that the Most High himself will take care of me forever. So it's, it's a vast contrast between the two. And it sounds a little bit like a prophecy in Revelation, like in verse 16 uh, or 17 in Coptic Creator. It says, so they shall receive the royal crown of splendor, the diadem of beauty from the hand of the Lord. Remember how the virtuous were viewed by the ungodly while they were on earth? They were viewed as like as weak, as uh, like they were disdained. Like even the sight of them was detestable to the ungodly on earth. But now they shall receive in, in before the eyes of everybody the total opposite. They shall receive the royal crown of splendor, the diadem of beauty from the hand of the Lord. Um, but that's not the best part. The best part is uh, in the rest of verse sixteen, for He will shelter them with his right hand and shield them with his arm. Sounds alike like many imageries that we have seen throughout the whole Bible. Can you think of any parts in the Bible where we, we read something resembling this? Where, where God is like sheltering them with his right hand and shielding them with his arm. When I remember when St. Paul said about the the helmet and, the, you know, when uh, he was... Yes, we're going to talk about that in, in a minute, the armor oh. of God, but, but we didn't get to that part yet. This is when uh, Jesus was wowing Jerusalem. Yes. It's what else? Sometimes I want it, you know. So we've seen many imageries of this in the whole Bible, like the shepherd carrying the lamb, or or like a loving father carrying his child, or um, like in the Song of Songs, 
how the beloved was with the Shurmite, like with his arms and his hands. Um, this verse reminds me so much of Psalm 90, the second fi, uh, uh, the Lil Ali, the one who dwells, verses 1 and 2, it says, the one who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will lodge in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge, my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Can you imagine the the peace and the stillness and the safety and the comfort and the fearlessness and the lack of anxiety or concern in a baby that's like being carried and held like by the arms of their father? Uh, you know, that's one of the reasons why the devil really envies us and resents us and hates us. Because we, hopefully, God willing, God is willing, but hopefully um, we will get to dwell with the Most High on his throne. It says in Revelation 3.21, To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. That's why the enemy resents us so much. He resents the virtuous so much because they will get what he was dying to have what he was desiring to have but could not even come close to it remember how how what why satan fell and how he was the morning star lucifer he was you know one of the archangels a glorious archangel in isaiah 14 verses 12 to 13 it says how you are fallen from heaven o day star or morning star son of the dawn how you are cut down on the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend on heaven above the stars of God, and I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the far north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. I want to sit on God's throne. <clears throat> the enemy wanted to sit on the throne of the Most High and was cast down to the lowest pit, while the virtuous, even though they were made out of the lowest, out of dust and ashes, if they endure and if they live a virtuous, virtuous life, they get to sit on the throne of God with God, and that's one of the reasons why the enemy envies them and resents them so much. He does not want us to dwell in the shelter of the Most High. <clears throat> but it's, it's the, the, the contrast is, like St. Mary says in the Magnet, like he, he brings the, the, the high low and lifts up the lowly. Um, verse 17 or 18 in, in uh, after Creator, so I'm here in verse 17. Oops, need to. Um, for armor... Here we go now to the part that's like uh, the armor of God that Paul's talking about. For the arm, for armor, he will take his jealous love. He will arm creation to punish his enemies. The armor of God that we read about in Ephesians 6 is clarified here or, or crystallized here in Wisdom 5. The armor of God is actually his love for us. God's love for us is our armor, meaning our defense, our weapon. So he continues, like in the coming verses, he kind of breaks it down a little bit. He continues to clarify it or crystallizes it about the rest of the armor of God. First of all, he says that God's justice is our breastplate. God's justice is our breastplate. He will put on justice as a breastplate. Righteousness. Justice is righteousness. Living rightly is our breastplate. So what does the breastplate guard or protect Think of like the armory. Heart. Yeah. The heart, the, the most vital organs. You know, that's it's basically it's exactly when you see policemen wearing that that uh, bulletproof vest. That's that's the breastplate because it guards like the, the, the vital organs, the heart. And not only that, but not just the, the heart, now we're gonna go to the mind. God's judgment is our helmet. It says, and for a helmet. And for helmet, wear his undissembling judgment. I had to look up this word. I never saw it before. 
dissembling judgment means deceitful judgment, crooked, twisted, um, hidden, dishonest judgment. So his undissembling judgment means God's sincere, well-defined, well-clarified just judgment. It's not, it's, yeah, dissembling judgment is like, like a contract that's written by a, by a sneaky, you know, attorney or something like that. Like the word can be read this way or can be read that way. Like God's judgment, a lot is is undissembling. It's very clear. There's no wonder. Does God want this or does God want that? No, we know what He wants. <clears throat> That's our helmet that guards and protects our mind and our thoughts. God made it very clear to us that He cares about and watches our thoughts and our matters of the heart, much more so than our deeds and our actions and our words. That's what's important. That's what's vital. Because that's that's the source that is hidden from everybody, but only God sees. Yeah, and we've said this so much, y'all. Like it keeps coming up in pretty much every book of the Bible that we've studied so far, where he this is what we need to focus. This is the front line of the battle. We need to watch what? our thoughts less. We need to watch our thoughts. We need to watch our intentions. And and sadly, many of us are so focused and consumed with saying the right things, behaving the right way, looking righteous in front of people, and we let all kinds of garbage go on in our minds and our thoughts. That's disastrous. And we will sooner or later... If we let the thoughts roam in our minds, the bad ones, we will sooner or later fall in. But if we focus on the source, then, you know, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the heart, the body will, will behave. Uh, I am Mama, yes. Um, you're muted. The meaning of undissembling? Judgment. Sorry, say that again. 518, the word undissembling, his undissembling judgment. No, yes. yani it's, it's clear, sincere. Uh, it's oh. not twisted. It's not hidden. Okay. It's very well defined, very, very well clarified judgment. And it's, yeah, it's just judgment. Okay. I want to have a question. It, it... Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's my understanding, so that's why I'm asking. It, it seems like if we are these three verses, it's kind of like if you walk God's path, you kind of like receive these. It's not like we are putting the helmet. It's like we're receiving them as as a reward for walking God's path. That's that's correct, or yes, and we're gonna get way into that in like in the next chapter, in chapter six, in no. When you see God, this is actually, when you see God and to live according to his will, this is like you actually putting on the helmet, putting on the breastplate, putting all this. And like I was saying earlier, the armor, the whole armor is God's love for us. So actually, in, if you think about it in the baptism, like the Bible says, it says we put on Christ. So the armor is, is put on us. Now we just need to keep it on. We need to. Just stick with God's guidelines, his boundaries, the laws, his commandments. That's our armor. Yeah, and he, as he said also, like, hey, no one snatches you out of my hand. And I just need to stay in his hand. Nobody. The enemy is tied down. He cannot reach us. But I have free will. I can walk out of his hand. I can take off the armor and expose parts of my body, my heart or my mind or my whatever. Thankfully, with repentance and confession, it's the new baptism. I can go, get washed, get healed, and put the armor back on again. We just need to endure, keep it on. It, but you're absolutely right. We focus so much on what do I do? How can I acquire this? Whatever. You just need to stick with God. Live according to his will. The whole armor is God himself. It's a good point. Then in verse um, 19, so so we talked about the, the breastplate, 
uh, the helmet. And then it says, a, living a life of holiness is what will save us from the fiery darts of the enemy. Like his temptations, his attacks. Where it says, he will take up invincible holiness for a shield. I love the word invincible. Can't break through. When I walk circumspectly. When I walk circumspectly, when I focus on staying away from any evil and anything in the similitude of evil, if it smells like evil, right? Um, staying away from anything that even smells like evil or in the similitude of evil, that's what's going to shield me from the fiery darts of the enemy, his attacks of doubt, of temptations, or whatever. Holiness is an invincible shield. What is holiness? Living in a holy way, living righteously. And then um, verse 20. Um, yes. God's word coming out of his mouth is our weapon with which we attack the enemy. Yani, so all the previous ones we talked about are like shield, helmet, um, uh, breastplate. They're all like defensive if you think about it. But now but we're going to talk about the offensive. And, and it is also defensive. Like you can, you can say like the sword is for defense and for offense. Uh, I love how he said a biting sword. Like biting is an action of the mouth, right? He will forge a biting sword of his stern wrath, and the universe will march with him to fight the reckless. The whole universe. Remember we said the sword, how to remember what our weapon is, is the sword. Sword. S, word. That's how you spell sword. S, word. Spiritual word. Word of God. The whole universe, all of creation, marches with God in disproving the reckless, and the ignorant who claim that there is no God and testifies of the sovereignty of God, of his divinity. We read a lot of verses like that, like Psalm 18, uh, verses 1 to 3. It says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament show his handiwork. Yeah. Day unto day utter speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There's no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's, it's mind-boggling how those who want to claim that there is no God, they can look at creation and still insist that there is no God. Because creation testifies of his divinity, of his sovereignty, of him. Marches mm -hmm. with him. In um, Romans uh, 120, it says, for since the creation of the world, his invincible, God's invincible, invisible, sorry, attributes, that is his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly perceived, being understood by what has been made, so that they are without excuse. Who's they? People. Romans what? One twenty. Think. People are without excuse. Um. Those who decide to be atheist. You know, on Judgment Day or in, on Hades, or you know, when they're when they're faced with this, they, they're not going to be able to say, "Well, I don't know." There was, there was no evidence that there's a God. No, there's plenty of it. You just didn't want to see it. Like we said it many times before, those who want to believe will believe no matter what, and those who don't want to believe won't believe no matter what. <laughs> so, the whole universe, all of creation marches with God in disproving the reckless and the ignorant who claim that there is no God and testifies of his sovereign divinity. And not only that, but throughout the entire Bible, throughout the entire Bible, creation was always partnering with God, fighting alongside with God was always marching and testifying of God's divinity and sovereignty. Can you think of any example, and there's plenty of them, where creation marched with God or worked with God or cooperated with God to show his sovereignty? 
أبونا ترزا صالم السماوات تحدث the heaven speaks about God Yeah, Psalm 18, 1 to 3. That's the one I just mentioned. I mentioned Psalm 18, verses 1 to 3, and Romans 1, verse 20. Thank you. So, can you think of any examples where creation marched with God, testified for God? Jesus walking on water. Okay. The water uh, uh, cooperated with God marched with God to show that yani, his sovereignty. Very good. Tons of things. Tell me more. The flood. Thank you. The flood, the rains and the and the underground springs that came out of the ground for the flood. They cooperated with God. When Moses left his hand and the sun stopped. There you go. The, the the fire of Sodom and Gomorrah. Yes. Came from up. There's tons tons of things. Like uh, like y'all said, the rain and underground currents at the time of Noah's flood. Along with not just that, but the animals, the birds, the raven, the dove, like all the animals that cooperated with Noah to get you think he went and herded them into the ship, into the ark? No, oh, they like just all walked on in there, just like the movie. <laughs> um, the rainbow, or you can say like light waves and moisture in the air, and the air carrying the moisture. They cooperated with God to show the rainbow. You mentioned the hail and fire and sulfur from the skies at the time of Sodom and Gomorrah. The Red Sea splitting for the Israelites and closing on the Egyptians. Before that, the Nile turning to blood. The frogs, the flies, the hail, the rock gushing water. Um, Y'all mentioned that when the sun stopping, it suspended when Joshua was fighting, fighting the battle. Um, the the quail that flew and landed to where the Israelites were, so they can eat meat when they rebelled, because they were sick of the men. The men. The splitting of the sea. Yes. Red sea. Um. Tons and tons of examples. The earth opening up and swallowing Korah and Dathan and Abiram and their households. Or the fire that consumed the 250 men with them for their rebellion. It's all creation, working with God. The clouds and the skies that obeyed Elijah when he prayed and, and it did not give a drop of rain for three and a half years. Um... The bears, the two bears that mauled the, the 42 boys who were insulting Elisha. You know that story? When Elisha was walking and, and th this group of youth were making fun of him, saying, hey, baldy, hey, baldy, or go baldy. And, and a couple of bears came and mauled them. The story of um, Jonah, the prophet, the whale, the sea, the wind, the tempest, the gourd that grew up in a day, the worm that gave the... Gourd, the scorching east wind that that was super hot. Everything. You know what else I was thinking too about that the fish that hurried and jumped into the nets of St. Peter and St. Andrew and St. John and St. James in Luke 5. Remember the calling of them? It's actually the Sunday's gospel. Hmm. All of creation marches with God, cooperates with God, works with God, testifies to his glory and divinity and sovereignty. <laughs> the only creation who gives him a hard time is unfortunately some of us. Not all of us, but some of us. Um, and then he, he continues to give examples of creation marching with God at the end of times as well as, as we read in Revelation about the bowls of woe. The, when the angels will pour uh, on the earth, he describes some of them here, actually, in, in the next few verses, verses um, 21 and 22. Uh, make sure I'm on this. Uh, it says, bolts truly aimed, the shafts of lightning will leap. And from the clouds, as from a full drawn bow, they fly to their mark. 
and the catapult will hurl hailstones charged with fury. The waters of the sea will rage against them. The rivers engulf them with pity, without pity. And verse 23, the breath of omnipotence will blow against them and winnow them like a hurricane. All creation. And what will cause all this horrifying, wrathful end on earth? Sin. As it continues in the rest of uh, verse 23, or it's in verse 24 in Coptic Reader. So lawlessness will bring the whole earth to ruin, and evil doing will bring the thrones of the mighty down. Sin and lawlessness. <clears throat> evil doing. So, here in chapter 5, he shows us the contrast between the life of the godless and the life of the virtuous. Uh, both here on earth and at, at judgment, like on judgment day, like the judgment or the end of the godless versus the judgment or the reward of the virtuous on judgment day and for eternity. Okay, so we see this big contrast. Now we can jump into uh, chapter six. But before we do, does anybody have any comments or questions or anything about, about what we did so far? Nope. Okay. Chapter six. So I need someone to read, let's see, from verse uh, one through 11. I will. Thank you. Which one will you read? Um, let's do the white one on the right. Okay, that's uh, RSV. Okay. The name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God to me. Go ahead. Listen, therefore, O kings, and understand. Learn, O judges of the end of the earth. Give ear, you that rule over multitudes and boast of many nations. For your dominion was given you from the Lord, and your sovereignty from the Most High, who will search you, who will search out your works and inquire into your plans. Because as a servant of the of his kingdom, you did not rule rightly, nor keep the law, nor work walk according to the purpose of God. He will come upon you terribly and swiftly, because severe judgment falls on those in high places. For the lowliest man may be pardoned in mercy, but mighty men will be mightily tested. For the Lord of all will not stand in awe of anyone, nor show deference to greatness, because he himself made both great and small, and he takes thought for all alike. But a strict inquiry is in store for the mighty. To you then, O monarchs, my words are directed, that you may learn wisdom and not transgress. For they will be made holy who observe holy things in holiness, and those who have been taught them will find a defense. Therefore, set your desire on my words, long for them, and you will be instructed. Glory to the Holy Trinity, our God, for I to these volleys. I mean, thank you. Okay. How do I say this now? Like the fun begins, <laughs> if you will. Up to this point, we read mostly about the contrast in the life and the end of those who live virtuously and those who live godlessly between um, those who live by wisdom and those who choose not to live by wisdom. Now in chapter 6, he begins to talk uh, about wisdom itself and, and her importance and her significance. <clears throat> So he starts with directing his advice or commandments to rulers or kings or those who are in positions of authority. So right away, one may, may start to read this and think, well, that's for kings and queens and rulers. Yes, yeah, not for me. It has nothing to do with me. No. Every single one of us is a king or a queen or a ruler. 
at the very least, at the very least, you are a ruler or have authority over yourself. In addition to that, you you have um, authority or you may have authority over like those whom you serve, those whom you teach, uh, over those you employ or supervise at work, over those you treat, like if you're in the medical field, over those in your household. But at the very least, if you don't have any of the above, you have authority and you rule over yourself. So this is for you. That's what I wanted to, to say. This is for each one of us. Don't dismiss it because I'm no king or queen or ruler or whatever. What's interesting here is when you look at the three translations is that Coptic Reader has like an introductory verse before it becomes similar to RSV or the Jerusalem Bible, which is interesting. And that's why I'm, I'm, I'm glad yeah, we're looking at the three voices. And it's so profound that I'm glad we, we have them all open so we could find it. And I think we need to slow down a little bit and pay good attention to it because it's one of those verses that, that are like life canons, you know, to live by. So right now, you're not going to find this in one in RSV or Jerusalem, but you'll find it here in Coptic Creator. It says, wisdom is better than power. And a prudent man is better than a powerful man. Can you... Think of some differences between wisdom and power. You don't need power to be wise. Okay. And as we see, a lot of times, as we power see is often, about the self. Uh, and as we see often, like you don't also need wisdom to be powerful. <laughs> Sorry, Missy, what was that? That a lot of times power is about the self and Powerful. and wisdom is not. Yes. Very good. Mm, I kind of disagree, Abuna. <clears throat> Sometimes you receive power as, as part of your position or or you receive power by the people around you who kind of like annoy you as their speaker or something like that sometimes you just receive it mm -hmm. so it's not it's not just self it's it's from the people like the source of power is from the people around you uh yes no, no qualms here okay missy what do you say i said power is about the self and wisdom is not, but I understand. I don't know who just said that, but I understand their point. So yeah, it's uh, it's about um, influence more. Um, yes. So yeah, there's there's lots of differences between wisdom, and uh, so go ahead, somebody. Yeah, can I say wisdom is a grace from God? He gives it to us, but the power uh, is grown. Something grown. In the world, mm. yeah, and somebody sometimes saying, yes, but sometimes not necessarily. And, we, and the verses actually will tell us in in a minute. But yes, sometimes yes. Somebody, uh, UT. I don't know who that is, but they were going to say something. That's me, Abuna. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't going to say anything. Okay. No, some yeah, like for example, Jesus gave gave the disciples, and then and then the church after him after the disciples, the power to forgive sins, right? So it's, I, I think, I think what it meant for here is, is, is that wisdom is better than, than power because power without wisdom is just going to be a destruction power. Yes, yes, yes. And wisdom without power is still wisdom. <laughs> wisdom by itself is powerful. Yes. So, Many contrasts. So wisdom, as we know, as we learn, is the knowledge of God, the fear of God. Not to be afraid of God, but to take God seriously because you love him so much and to be keen to live according to God's commandments. It has to do with God. Wisdom has to do with God. True wisdom. True wisdom. There's like earthly wisdom that's not really wisdom. It's more like knowledge, I guess, or savvy. Power may be given by God, 
but it has to do with either with self or with position or with ability. Um, and it could be like physical bodily power. It could be intellectual power, power of beauty, power of knowledge, power of like craftiness, if you will. Um, also wisdom has to do more with influence over me, over myself. Power has to do more with influence over others. This is nice. Wisdom causes others to follow a leader because they want to. While power can cause people to follow a leader because they have to. When a person is really wise, they are a leader, and the people want to follow this person because they, they, you know, it's obvious. Um, <clears throat> many people are powerful, and many people follow them because they have to. Case in point, just look at any video of stuff that happens in North Korea. <laughs> um, I think um, there was one time. Somebody was telling me this. I don't remember when, but there was like the, uh, I don't even remember his name, but like the president, you know, was giving some speech or some talk and then everybody stood up to clap and they were clapping for like, I don't know, 10, 12 minutes or something. And nobody would dare to stop clapping because they were afraid if they were the first one to stop clapping, then it won't be good. And and then one, after 10 or 12 minutes of clapping, one of them stopped and then the rest stopped. But he was, uh, what's the word? court martial you know like they they had to bring us like why did you stop like and like was threatened and <laughs> not uh power but people people follow because they have to um and just like as we're saying power may may not will but may lead to fear but wisdom will lead to love true wisdom so Wisdom is definitely better than power. And a prudent person is definitely better than a powerful person. And now we go to the other two translations. So this is verses 1 and 2 in, in RSV and um, uh, the, the Jerusalem Bible. Listen then, O kings, and understand rulers of the remotest lands. Take warning. Hear this, you who have thousands. <laughs> um, you who have thousands under your rule, who boast of your hordes of subjects. So, again, this is for everyone. Any one of us who has any level of rule or authority, as we said before. It could be political authority, occupational authority, clerical authority, familial, parental authority, and as we said, if nothing else, self-rule, again, authority over self, uh, which, as we said before, as y'all said, like is all given by God. The first and foremost thing you need to know, we need to know, it's in verse 3. Um verse power and Coptic creator. Power is a gift to you from the Lord. Sovereignty is from the Most High. That rule or power or authority, no matter what kind it is, is from God. Is a gift from God. Um, a stewardship from God. A manna. It's not it's not something that you made happen because of your own ability. Something that you made for yourself. You know, it's many people, like we think that, like I I got myself to this power, but think about it. There are many people out there who are smarter than us, stronger than us, uh, wiser than us, harder working than us and all that stuff, but they don't have hardly any power of other, you know, stewardships or positions. It is given by God. Reminds me of uh, when Pontius Pilate was telling our Lord Jesus Christ in John 19, 
verses 10, 11, he said, do you know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? Do you remember what Jesus said to him? Jesus answered, he said, you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. So, since it is a gift from above, from the Most High, God, heads up, He will, He Himself will probe your acts and scrutinize your intentions. We're still in verse 3 here, or 4 in Coptic Creed. He will ask you, God will ask you to give an account of your stewardship. What did you do or how did you use the power or authority that the Most High God gave you or entrusted you with? <laughs> Typically, most people are delighted when they are entrusted in a position of power or authority. They feel really good. Um... But that's not the, that's not yeah. Yani, those who get it, those who who like understand this this ver this verse here, that God will will probe you and will scrutinize your intentions and will question you about this, ask you to give account. That's why, um, typically when one is ordained like as a patriarch or a priest, they are typically doing what, crying and weeping, <laughs> um. Or they try to run away from it and hide. We read about those sometimes, like right in the Synexarium. They run away and they go grab them and tie them down and 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 like do it by force. Um, some of them run away to other countries or to go hide, go in hiding or something. You know? I will never forget the look of joy and relief on the face of His Grace Bishop Raphael. May God protect him when they announced that he was not the one that the lot fell upon to be patriarch. Remember that? When it was it was him and his holiness Pope Tawadros and uh, Abuna uh, Rafael of Amina. And they were the like the, the final three. And then during that historical moment of picking the name, you know, when they picked the name and, and, and Baba Khumis held the name and said uh, Amba Tawadros. And you saw Amber Rafael and, and Amber Tadros were like holding each other and hugging. Like Amber Rafael was like over the moon. <laughs> that's that's wisdom. That's that's prudence as opposed to power. Also notice something very important here. Um, not only will God examine your works and see what you did with the authority or the power he gave you, but he will also do what? He will scrutinize your intentions. And the other ones, it says scrutinize your thoughts. <clears throat> um, we talked a ton about the, the most high, the most important uh, yani, are the thoughts and the intentions. So we're not going to yani, keep talking about that. Um, St. John Chrysostom has a nice quote. It says, do not desire to be the head because the head suffers many aches. And when you think about it, um, if your toe hurts, your head suffers. If your stomach aches, your head suffers. If your vision is off, your head suffers. So do not desire to be the head because the head suffers many aches. <clears throat> Excuse me. So heads up. Verse four. <laughs> that was no pun intended. Um, if as administrators of his kingdom, if, look at that right here, if as administrators of his kingdom. So this um, is... Uh, like this is addressing now, he's addressing now clergy or bishops or priests or servants, right? Because they're administrators of his kingdom. No. Again, any power or authority 
or over anything or anyone, even over yourself, is given to you by the Most High God for the service of his kingdom. That's even the power of authority over yourself. It's for the service of his kingdom. So, verse 4 in, in Jerusalem Bible. If as administrators of his kingdom you have not governed justly, nor observed the law, nor behaved as God would have you behave, so right away it tells you how God wants you to live, right? To govern justly, to observe the law of God, and to live and behave according to his commandments. Does this remind you of any passages? About how God wants you to live? As the gospel of Christ. They. Is it, say is as the gospel of Christ. Yes. Yeah, that's like the time. But I was actually asking about uh, like if there's a passage that says, how does God want you to live? Oh, man. Or oh, human. Yeah, and it's this is so consistently, I mean, uh, to govern justly, observe the law, or to behave as God would have you behave. It's very, very consistent with Micah 6 6 or 6 6 to 8. I love this passage. It's 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 one of our favorite passages. Micah 6 6 to 8. It says, With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give him my firstborn for my transgressions, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? God is the source of all of this stuff. And then Micah 6, 8, there's that, that famous verse. He has shown you, O man, what is good, how he wants, what he wants. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. I, I was saying the verses by Arabic. It's Aishu kama hakal ingil. Yes, to live according to the gospel of Christ. Yes, yes. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, so do you see that the undissembling judgment? Yeah, it's so clear what God wants from us. It's not mysterious. And it's not hard. Um, if you have not lived this way, then, verse 5, um, he will fall on you swiftly and terribly. Ruthless judgment is reserved for the high and mighty. Be mindful of that. Those who, who were given power or authority, which is everyone, but they did not live according to how he wants in verse 4 to, to um, govern justly, observe the law, and uh, behave as God would have you behave. And if you ever have a hard time to desire the lowly and and the lowly state and to not desire them to be mighty, then verse 6 is for you and for me. Um says, the lowly will be compassionately pardoned. The mighty will be mightily punished. So when you think about it, with what can one impress God since God gave them everything, including their own life, by basically acknowledging it, by humbling themselves. So like by, by even if I am placed in a place of authority or power or whatever, to remain lowly inside in my heart. It'll be good for me because if I remain that way, truly that way, and only, only God sees the heart, okay, and me. And yeah, then I will be compassionately pardoned. Um, let's go to verse seven. How are we on time? Now we're still good. 
verse 7. For the Lord of all does not cower before a personage. He does not stand in awe of greatness, since he himself has made small and great and provides for all alike. And just in case you still have any desire for power or authority, he reiterates it in verse 8. Sorry, Abuna, what he meant by the mightly will be mightly judged or punished. It's a play on words, Yani. You want to be all powerful and mighty, then your judgment will be mighty and powerful. Is it like uh, if you know more, you will be asked to do, to give yeah. more, right? Yes. <laughs> but strict scrutiny awaits those in power. Um. Verse 9, I also learned another new word in it. Yes, I think it's it's pronounced despots. Yes, despots. Yeah, he's talking to them. He is addressing despots. My words are for you, that you may learn what wisdom is and not transgress. Despots, I looked it up. It means monarchs. But typically, like monarchs or rulers, like those who, who have absolute power, but they rule in a like a cruel or oppressive or harsh way, who lord it over people, whatever position they have. So my words are for you, verse 10. For they who observe holy things holily will be adjudged holy, and accepting instructions from them will find their defense in them. Meaning a those who sincerely try their best to live in a holy way, to observe holiness in their life, this will be their defense on judgment day. They will they will holily be a just holy, meaning uh, pronounced holy. And holily means like righteously. They will be pronounced holy. And then he adds another notch to it. Um in addition to what he said in verse 1 earlier, remember in verse 1 he said, listen, you rulers and you kings. Okay, And now in verse 11, uh, uh, or, or in verse 12 in Coptic Reader, he says, I hate it when they're different because I have to keep saying that. But he's saying what? Yeah, don't just listen, but also yearn for it. Seek it. Search for it. Look forward, therefore, to my words. Yearn for them, and they will instruct you. And of course, he doesn't mean just search for it to find it or to know it, but to actually eh, live by it, to apply it. There are those who seek wisdom and knowledge for the sake of having wisdom and knowledge. That means they're seeking some sort of power, actually. Um, they may think... The heart is deceitful. Yani. I may convince myself of having good intentions and that I'm seeking something good, but yani, that's why we need our Father confession and because he loves us so much to placate us and will be honest with us. And God's word will clearly remind us, like, hey, <laughs> um, yani, don't just seek it and be happy that you're seeking it. No, seek it for the purpose of living by it because, like Mama said earlier, to those who know more, more will be expected. So, if you want to seek knowledge or more, remember that you're going to be asked about this. Uh, yes, Max. I want to ask about the part of seeking the knowledge means you're seeking power. And be careful about it. Mm, I'm not sure. Uh, how can I balance between seeking the knowledge to benefit myself and the others, like for example, for the service or stuff, so, um, my kids or something. And at the same time to protect yourself from ego, pride. I don't know, I know you mean like seeking the knowledge, be careful about it because you're seeking power, maybe more judge, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's a very good yeah. question. 
I'm mm-hmm. thinking out loud now. I'd love to leave answers from, from everybody here, but but two things come to mind. Number one is to always know your why. Why am I seeking knowledge? Why am I seeking wisdom? What do I want to do with this? And then, yeah, and, and I have to be honest with myself. Um, the second thing to maybe, because I can answer myself, yes, and I want knowledge and wisdom so that I can serve God's kingdom. But so I I can't fool myself. So that brings us to the second point, which is to simply ask myself, how faithful am I being with what I already know? We're never going to be perfectly faithful with it, of course, because we fall on our face many times a day. But like, what did I do with the knowledge and the wisdom that I already gained or gleaned? <clears throat> do I just say, oh Allah, this is so nice, this is uh, deep, this is really profound, and I maybe share it with others or or preach it to others or whatever. And But uh, what am I doing with it? Am I, am I applying it in my life? Do I live by it when I'm in my own head? Do I live by it when I'm by myself in a room or in a house by myself? Nobody sees. This will, will reveal to me, I think, um, or will help me I to will... stay uh, balanced. Yes, go ahead. Abuna, don't you think, though, that I mean, this kind of wisdom that we're talking about is really the spirit of God who cannot be manipulated. So even if we come with false intentions, we're not getting his wisdom, right? So we might we might learn some things because we read commentaries or or we listen to lots of sermons, but that's not like it may be truth, but it's not the kind of wisdom this is talking about this is I talking agree. about like being able to to move with god and to be able to discern and see things different i i totally agree thank you for that like we need to be careful not to mingle or or mix up wisdom with knowledge um i i, I didn't understand that. can you explain more Go ahead, miss. I think that what Abuna was saying is is right in terms of like how we can assess if we're coming to the table in a sincere and authentic way in seeking this wisdom. But at the end of the day, the wisdom that we are seeking is not knowledge. The wisdom that we're seeking is God himself. And if we get that, then we came authentically. Oh, the, uh, in the, okay. In the first chapter, it says that, like, if we come to him in an insincere way, we don't get wisdom. Hmm. I got you now. So you're trying to separate between the knowledge, it's the meaning of knowledge itself, and the meaning of the of the wisdom as God Himself. Which, if I gain it, I gain Him, so I can get. All knowledge, I think. Am I right? Did I understand? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Mason. There's a nice um. Yeah, it's a very good point to differentiate. There's a, a nice um. What I heard a long time ago that says that wisdom is the um. Godly application of knowledge. Um. Knowledge by itself is just knowledge. Wisdom is actually applying knowledge the right way as intended. Um, good question. Okay. Now, in the next passage, he will start describing wisdom and talking about wisdom herself. <clears throat> so this verse uh, 12 to 21 I have it highlighted here, so which means the verse 13 and called the creator, verse 12 to 21 RSV. Okay, yeah, who will read? I'll read. Thank you. Which version? I uh, will do the, is it the RSV on the right? Okay. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God to me. Wisdom is radiant and unfading. And she is easily discerned by those who love her and is found by those who seek her. She hastens to make herself known to those who desire her. 
He who rises early to seek her will have no difficulty, for he will find her sitting at his gates. The fix one's thought on her is perfect understanding, and he who is vigilant on her account will soon be free from care, because she goes about seeking those worthy of her, and she graciously appears to them in their paths and meets them in every thought. The beginning of wisdom is the most sincere desire for instruction, and concern for instruction is love of her. And love of her is the keeping of her laws, and giving heed to her laws is assurance of immortality, and immortality brings one near to God. So the desire for wisdom leads to a kingdom. Therefore, if you delight in thrones and scepters, O monarchs over the peoples, honor wisdom that you may reign forever. Glory be to the whole Trinity, our God, for everyone to be as well as me. Thank you. I need to sound like to just kind of, I don't know. It's, uh, I love it. Um, okay. Verse 12 in Jerusalem RSV says, Wisdom is bright and does not grow dim. She is a perpetual source of clarity and vision. She is, she is the unfading perpetual light of the world. As, as we say in the fraction of wisdom, wisdom is our Lord Jesus Christ. And says, by those who love her, she is readily seen and found by those who who look for her. This is fantastic news for us, y'all. Why is wisdom easily found and readily seen by those who look for her? Why or how? Because when you talk with people and stuff, you know, they make it seem like it's so mysterious, so devious, so hard to find. I think because wisdom is God and we are all looking for God, what else we're searching for? We're looking for him. Okay. And God and wants what? You're right. So finish the thought. I... God wants us to to keep searching and he's helping us to find it. Yeah. God wants to be found. Exactly. God wants us to know him. So, uh, you know, what's in John 8, I think 31, 32, it says, this is the assurance that we have um, when we approach God, that if we ask him according to his will, he will hear us. And if he hears us, we will have the petitions that we made of him. And Abuna so, Wisdom herself is uh, looking for us, searching for us to come to her. When, when it's, she said, I prepared my table, I put my wine, Come to hear you, fool, as things like that. I yes, don't know. My wisdom is, is God. My wisdom is yeah, and accountant in Isaiah, I think. Okay. Yeah. Um, what else? Go ahead, uh, Modi. Or whoever. I don't know. Somebody was going to say something. Yeah, I, I was going to say the first thing comes in my mind when you said easily um, the verse in James chapter 1. Verse number five, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. Ask. Yeah, who gives to all liberally and yeah, without the brooch. Mm -hmm. So yeah. easy, ask, ask God, ask for God. Search about God, not the wisdom itself, because God is wisdom. Yes, and like Missy was saying earlier, you're not going to be able to fool God. If you seek for wisdom, but for um, erroneous, faulty, selfish reasons, you're not really yes. seeking for wisdom. You're not yes. asking for it. You're asking for something else. And hopefully okay. you don't get that. <laughs> um, anyone else? There's another reason why uh, wisdom is readily seen and easily found by those who look for her. Abuna... <laughs> I will earn if I know wisdom, or if I am wise, I will know, yani, I will be very joyful, very happy, because it teaches me everything that will give me joy. Mm -hmm. 
and to be more, more and more and more faithful and near to God, near to her. Yes, that's true. Um, but regarding like my question, why is what is another reason if you can think of one? For anybody else. Wisdom, if we said that God is wisdom and in the same time he said I don't know how to say this in English. Mm -hmm. So you it's can go like find, ask, ask, and you will be answered. See, so can you find and knock, and it will be open for you. So he wants us to find him, and he's just waiting for us. So it's kind of like just ask. I'm here. Yes. <clears throat> so that's related to the to the first point we were talking about. You, the you other one. Sincere. Sorry, go no, ahead, see, Michael. No, see, you need a sincere heart. Aywa. And. You know, I think going back to what like Missy was saying, I don't think a person with bad intentions would even be truly asking for wisdom. They might be asking to, you know, give me give me a a, a smart mind. You know, they're 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 not thinking in terms of wisdom, which is which is you know, intertwined with love. Yes. So I don't think they even had the capacity to even ask for that. Yes. And I and I keep thinking of Solomon and asking him to give him, you know, that that warm and discerning heart. There you go. There you go. But here's the the danger is Michael, I totally agree with you, is that those people who are not really asking for wisdom, they may think that they are sincerely asking for wisdom. And that's the danger. That's why we should not trust ourselves. Because I may be seeking for other stuff, but I may convince myself that I'm seeking for wisdom. So it's dangerous to trust myself. Completely opposite of what the world tells you. Trust your God. You know, go with what you know. Mm -mm -mm. Um, they may call it wisdom, but I, I, I don't think that they're... They may be calling it wisdom, but I don't think what they're asking for is wisdom. I agree. You know, I, I, I don't think unless you have that strong relationship with God that, you know what, when we say wisdom, we all know now it's, it's, we're talking about godly wisdom, not earthly knowledge and smarts and to be able to debate someone and be able to be a living Wikipedia, mm -hmm. you know, godly wisdom is completely different. It has nothing to do with being smart. Yes. Um. Some of the wisest people ever were illiterate, simple. Uh, you reminded me of the story about um, a um, monk or bishop or abbot or something who was going from uh, a monastery and was waiting for uh, the little ferry or boat to cross the Nile. And then he saw uh, just a very simple poor man like making a basket or something and he all he was just saying, Lord God, love you, Jesus. Yes, Lee Jesus, you are my Lord. And that's all he's doing. He told him, What are you doing? He said, I'm praying. He said, um, oh, okay. Is is that all you, is that all you know? Did, did, did anybody teach you anything? He said, No, that's that's all I know. And he told him, do you, you don't even know the Lord's Prayer, like our Father who art in heaven. He said, What? No, tell me about it. What is that? What is that? That sounds cool. He's very eager. He told him, our father. He said, and he started to teach it to him while they were waiting for the boat. Or while well, he was waiting for the boat. And then the boat came and he got on the boat. And the man is like so happy and he's sewing his best. Like, our father who art in heaven. Our father who art in heaven. Uh, what's next? What's next? And he started running after the abbot. Now the boat left is in the water and he started running on the water. Say, my father, my father, what comes after heaven? What comes after heaven? And, and the abbot told him, uh, it's okay, you're good. <laughs> Just keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> um, so he walked back. He said, you're doing good. <laughs> to me, that's wisdom. Like, that's right there. It's all about the heart, Jamuna, right? Yes. You know, I, I think uh, one quick example is, okay, so we have Solomon, the wisest man on earth. Um his son, you know, mm. was it Rehoboam, starts off, and you, you obviously he got an amazing education being from the richest man on earth. I'm sure he had some great educators. And he gets power, and the first thing he does is that he listens to the unwisest people, his, his peers, instead of the elders. And 
he was ruthless. He had no discernment and it had nothing to do with smarts, but it had to do with his heart. Absolutely. So to summarize, why is wisdom so easily found and so readily seen by those who seek her? Two main reasons. Number one, because when you think about it, by definition, those who seek true wisdom and look for her, by their seeking her, they are proclaiming that they need her, like in Solomon. They are proclaiming with their deeds and intentions that they are humble, and we know the affinity of God to the humble. Okay, um, And the second thing is because, like y'all said, because seeking wisdom, to live by wisdom means you're seeking God himself, to live by his word himself. That your heart is directed towards him. And those wh whose heart is directed towards him will find him. Like that famous verse we often quote, Second Chronicles 16, 9. That for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Like God himself wants to reveal himself to those who are truly seeking wisdom. What is the reference, Abuna? Sorry. Second Chronicles 16 oh. 9. Two Chronicles 16 9. Okay. Question So, how can we protect ourselves from that deception? In other words, how can we get discernment and inner honesty of what we really are looking for? Um, Humbleness. My God, it's the, the stuff we talked about, like uh, Max was talking about, let me see. Um, I think uh, the stuff I was talking about earlier, like ask yourself, why do I seek this? Um, and ask yourself, uh, am I being faithful with um, what I was already given? Um, and to pray and ask God, God, I don't trust me. God, you know how how... A fool I make of myself. You know how I can deceive myself. And as you said, the heart is deceitful. Lord, if you leave me to my own ways, I'm going to destroy myself. So please don't let me fool myself. Guide me. Give me sources. Give me, you know, ways to help me see and decide. So you have it right here. Like there's the Bible study, God's word, your father confession, um, godly friends, discernment, um, discerning friends, etc. Um. Good question. And I I think also, Yanni, just those kind of questions themselves at least indicate that my heart is in the right place. And so even if I mess things up, Yanni, God knows. And, and, and he he likes that. He appreciates that. Um okay, we're out of time, so we're gonna stop here and they will continue, God will next time from verse 13. Or fourteen in in uh, Coptic reader uh, questions comments uh, okay there's one here so earthly wisdom is to know decisions that benefit you but heavenly wisdom is to make decisions that will make you get closer to him um, yeah that's a good way to look at it earthly wisdom like we said earlier, or knowledge, like it has to do with self or certain serving self or having power. It has to do with, with me more, um, even if it's granted by other people to me. Um, the heavenly wisdom has to do more with God, uh, and it's all about him and for him. Um Questions, comments, concerns, compliments, or if anybody, as usual, if there's something that stood out to you that you would like to share uh, or that you're going to try to remember or to live by from tonight's Bible study. Yes. <clears throat> Go ahead. I, I want to say <clears throat> from now on, I'm thinking about to make it much easier. Means... Think about God more than think about forget that just live as God wants me to love, then I can I can find the wisdom. Mm. Yes. Easier. Much easier. 
and actually do it gladly, excitedly, joyfully, because he wants to be found. He he wants to reveal himself to us. Amuna, mm -hmm. uh, if I look at this chapter of wisdom as if I'm looking through the whole Bible, How? many things, many things in the wisdom are written in the Bible. If you look in Isaiah, if you look in Micah, if you look uh, uh, in Chronicles, look at Solomon in the, I don't know, Second King or which part. Wisdom is mentioned everywhere, and it is our way or our life to go through holding in it. Mm. I can imagine it, because it's God. It's yes. God. And God wants the best for us. We are his children. He doesn't want us to go astray from him. So he's feeding, feeding us with, with many things. If we dig in the Bible, we, we will reach a point that, I don't know, he might help us, that we will know him more and more. Of course, we'll not know him yani, that much, but according to our efforts and according what he's giving or what he's choosing to give us. Mm. Yeah, and it really, when, when you're reading the Bible, um, most of the times you can replace the word God with wisdom and you can replace the word wisdom with God. It, yes. Most of the times, so if it is godly wisdom. Um, you know, so I think I understand now, heavenly wisdom is sought by heart, earthly wisdom is sought by mind. Yeah, you can say that. Hopefully, actually, we, we want to seek the heavenly wisdom with both our heart and our mind and our strength and our might and everything. So question, how do you seek heavenly wisdom? Is the question here in the in the chat. How do you seek heavenly wisdom? How do you know it? What do you guys think? You can say the question is, how do you seek God? Right? I think, you know, any um, person who's looking to grow, whether in in, in in their in their job or in their spiritual life is always if the, the wise person is seeking a mentor and whether that's a spiritual father or someone who is spiritual themselves or you got a whole book here called the bible full of <laughs> of, of of people who've been and through ups and downs in their pursuit of god or they're running away from god and it's just it's filled with wisdom. So if you seek God and you seek a relationship with him through your spiritual father, through spiritual people, through the Bible, the wisdom will come to you. And um, I think that's how you do it. It's funny you, funny you said that because that's actually the the next verse that we will address next week. That you don't even have to, like wisdom actually is seeking after you. Wisdom is going ahead of you. But you mentioned two more important things. Number one is discipleship. Number two is is knowing God from his word. Yeah, and I, I, I use a yeah, an analogy to, to help explain this. Like so, Missy and I have been married over 31 years. We've known each other over 35 years. And like at any point in time, you can ask me, what will Missy think about this? Or what will she say about that? And I can tell you. Actually, almost word for word, and vice versa. It's funny because sometimes I'll be talking to somebody and they're like, oh my gosh, Missy said the same thing or vice, you know, vice versa. Why? Because we know each other. We spend so much time together. We talk and we converse and we go through life together. We we work together. We surf together. We talk together. We can, you know, we enjoy life together. So it's the same thing since heavenly wisdom is God. So I need to like work on knowing God, spending time with God, serving with God, working with God. Um, uh, being a disciple to those who have a good, strong, solid relationship with God. And just like we said, this lovely exercise when we read the Bible, when you read every chapter in the Bible, at the top right, the Lord is kaza, kaza, kaza. God is so and so. So, what he likes, what he doesn't like, what he prefers, what he, um, uh, how he deals with the oppressed, how he deals with the mighty, how he deals with the wise, how he deals with the humble, how he deals with the arrogant. You know, all these, like, get to know him. And boom, wisdom. 
All righty. Um, Y'all, <laughs> you haven't seen anything yet. Wait till we go deeper in this book. It's it's just uh, phenomenal. Full of wisdom. Uh -huh. <laughs> Let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Um, Lord, protect us from ourselves. Protect us from deceiving ourselves. Grant us, Lord, the courage and the humility and transparency to be honest with ourselves and to uh, be willing to be vulnerable with our Father's confession or, or godly wise friends to expose things and how we think and why we want what we want. Not just to want good things, O oh Lord, but to ask ourselves, why do I want those good things? And to make sure that it is for your kingdom, as you see here. Help us, O oh Lord, to not only listen, but to live by and to seek after you, your wisdom. We ask that to please hear us through the intercessions of me and all you saints and martyrs who please you from the beginning through the mighty power of your love given cross. Peace, O Lord, make us worthy to pray thankfully. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us as they are daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. I mean, and now the love of God, the Father, grace is on begotten Son, our Lord, God, and Savior, Jesus Christ, of the community, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Be with you all. Go in peace. The peace of the Lord be with you. With May wisdom be with you. you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. See you all next week. God willing. Thank you. Thank you.